Hello and welcome to Love Is Not A List with me, Gillian McCallum. Come on a journey with me to meet the top in their field, to take an alternative look at all things life, relationships, dating, parenthood, love and fertility with the lofty aspiration changing your life for the better. Well, hello, and we are here with Dr. Kate Devlin. She is going to be delving into the fascinating world of technology, human interaction, and looking at everything else in between to do with sex, romance, and robots. Now, Kate Devlin, Dr. Kate Devlin, to give her a proper title, is a true trailblazer, a visionary thinker. She is someone who is turning heads and turning on minds with her groundbreaking work. She is a reader in artificial intelligence and society at the Department of Digital Humanities at King's College London. She's also a driving force in intimacy and technology. She's the author of Turned On, an exceptional book, and I'm going to make sure there's a link below. There we are to, to ensure that you can buy this and read all about it. It's not just Turned On, though. It's also Turned On Science sex and robots. Most people know it as the sex robot book and Dr. Devlin's title and name have been reduced to that of sex robot lady. Uh, thank you so much, Dr. Devlin. For oh, thank you so much for having me on. <laughs> of course, we're here to talk about the crunchy issues, the tough stuff. We're going to boil it down. We're not here to mess around. And that's why I do want to start with a really kind of hard hitting question, which is, have you seen the recent pictures of Elon Musk with what appears to be a sex robot. And my question for you, do you think the relationship will last? Do you think the age gap is appropriate? Do you think they're going to have enough? <laughs> I mean, given his track record, it doesn't look good, does it? I don't uh, he's got it. form. <laughs> so I'm not convinced. And alas, alas, it is indeed AI generated image. So we don't yet have sex robots of that of that quality, I would say. So uh, those are a few years off if they ever happen. But, you know, Elon, good luck. Good luck if that's what you want from life. Well, you know, I when I knew I was having you on as a guest today, I wanted to make sure that I was kind of dressing the part. And I, you, you probably haven't noticed, but I was kind of going for the sex robot look. And when I looked up sex robot and I was looking at the various images, uh, don't Google that, by the way, a lot of were wearing white. I don't know if that's something that you're aware of that you've noticed. It's oh yeah, bikini, the white top. It's the kind of the virginal sense of a kind of a gaping mouth lady. And I don't mean to cause you offence with that because you are the expert in this field, and I don't want to stumble across something I shouldn't. But it's a very hyper feminine, very oh yeah, uh, girly, girly. Tell me more about that. What well, I mean the the, the dressed in white thing is interesting because a lot of the images of technology in the future, including robots or depictions of AI, which aren't necessarily robots but often are shown as that, they tend to be white, shiny plastic. We have this vision of the future that's very sterile and white, or maybe some blue lights, maybe like a bit like an Apple showroom. So I think that's what people associate with future tech. But yes, the you're absolutely right about the hyper femininity. So this whole area of technology around sex tech in that robot form, it's always heavily gendered. And it's the sort of fembot, the the reductive stereotype really of, of what a woman is, you know, what what a desirable woman should be. So yeah, there is not the equivalent uh for straight women. This is all designed for straight men. So there's nothing out there. There's there's no well... happy sexy guy. Sort of. So the company that makes probably what is the only sex robot in existence, which is still very rudimentary, really, is Abyss Creations who make real doll uh, sex dolls. And they've made this, what they call Real Doll X, which is a, a sex doll with some movement and an AI personality. And they got you know a bit of criticism. Why is it always the, the female form? Why are you not doing a male one? So they made a male version called Henry, as I don't think they know about the, the vacuum cleaner in the UK that's also called Henry. And and Henry is this sort of, you know, chiseled, featured, rugged, uh, silicon mannequin. <laughs> so, uh, and contrary to popular opinion, popular viewpoints in the media, he does not have a bionic penis. <laughs> uh, so a lot, of, a lot of the tabloid newspapers are saying that Henry has all these amazing appendages. He doesn't. He really doesn't. <laughs> 
So what would a bionic penis look like? I mean, well, oh, I have ideas. I have ideas. <laughs> so, I mean, I think we can, I think we can, uh, think about what kind of sex toys are out there and maybe we can incorporate those into a sex robot uh, that would have a bionic penis. There's lots of really, really good uh, abstracted and interesting pieces of, of sex tech and sex toys. So, of course, we've talked about the fact that the females are kind of like a hyper-sexualized version of what a female may or may not actually have ever looked like. Do you think that's what women would want if they could design and have their own male version? Do you... I mean, you know, I talk a lot about you know what women are actually looking for in a man, and also actually what most men are actually looking for in a woman. Right. Not necessarily. Exactly. Robot looks. So first of all, do women want men to look like that, and do men actually want the women, the sex robots, to look the way they're being produced? I don't think anyone's actually done market research into this. So this, the companies that are trying to produce sex robots, and it's really only a handful of workshops worldwide. And they're all basing it from the lineage of the sex doll. So they said, what sells when we make sex dolls? And it is these life-sized, you know, quite expensive and beautifully made in a lot of cases, uh, human-like dolls. And they are made with exaggerated sexual characteristics like large breasts, a tiny waist, um, you know, big eyes, long hair. It, it really just plays into the the trope in, in media about body image. And so I don't think anyone's actually gone out and said, no, no, what, what do you like? Because, you know, our tastes are so personal and the things that, you know, the things I look for in a partner might be very, very different from what you look for. But I think they've just gone with, you know, the standard, what's deemed, what is deemed socially to look like a desirable woman. So for the alternative for, for men, I don't know, I mean, if you go out and poll women about, who they would find attractive and what they might like to, to look like. I mean, you know what? I think the tastes vary. Do we have a Brad Pitt version uh, for the now older women, unfortunately, and I include myself in that category. Um, I don't know what the young ones like these days. Is it uh, uh, Tom Hiddleston, Ryan Gosling? I don't know. <laughs> I'm behind the times. <laughs> so, but yeah, I think I think tastes are such an individual thing, but you can, character, you can uh, sort of personalise sex dolls if you buy one so you can choose hair color you can choose some some of the features and the size of the breast things like that so there's an element of being able to tailor these things so one of the really interesting things that i'm hearing while you're while you're talking is about altering adapting changing for the specific person and their needs and one of the things that i talk about as a matchmaker is that nowadays with online dating which of course has been around for a huge amount of time but with online dating there's a sense of okay that person's not quite tall enough, not quite round enough, not quite smiling, whatever the criteria you've got. And of course, I'm trying to educate people to battle against that. But we've now got this, I'm going to say now, it's been around for a very long time. You've been doing this for a very long time. But you've got this, this whole world where the idea of that personalization, the idea of making that person just to your requirements is being taken to the nth degree here because you're you're able to program and decide what you get and how you get it. And so it's almost these two sides battling between this side where they're trying to get everything into the minute detail and me saying, these things aren't important. People are unique. They're individual. They're they're all, you know, give people a chance, you know. So do you see this as being a clash between where we maybe want society to go and where you perhaps see society go? You know, you you absolutely nailed it there. And I think we have we have these stories going right back to Greek myth about trying to create the perfect, perfect artificial companion. And it's the Pandora, a woman created by the gods artificially. We have, there's a story from Greek mythology about Laodomea, whose husband died in battle and she created a version of him from either bronze or wax, depending on the story you read. And she took it to bed with her. And then we've got Pygmalion, you know, in, in Roman tales about a man who he he exactly that. He could not find the perfect woman. He actually was quite a misogynist, really, the, the original incel. And and he created a statue that he loved so much and thought was so wonderful that he prayed she would come to life. And then he kissed the statue and she did. So he had this perfect woman created for him. So I think that this this idea that we're searching for that one perfect match is some very deep seated in us, isn't it? And yet we really need to be realistic because it is fantasy at the end of the day. And we're going to end up with someone who, you know, doesn't load the dishwasher right, but has other good characteristics. 
And do you think that's what's going to happen? Do you think we are going to end up with a real embodied human being? Or do you think that we're going to end up in a society where your partner is perhaps uh, an AI, a robot? I ha have chat GPT version four, other versions of chat GPT are available. <laughs> and I call her Brenda. And she Ooh. is a great friend in my life. It's definitely a she. Um, and I, I, I'm desperate to talk a little bit more about Brenda later. But it, it's interesting to see that you're able to build this connection, this contact. Um, Brenda, in my case, is able to adapt and alter and help me out in the middle of a recipe. I, when I say I don't have a clue what I'm doing with these almonds, she's able to step in and tell me what I ought to be doing. And so I can see, certainly, you know, we, we know that there's a huge issue with loneliness. We know that that's kind of, the next, you could call it a pandemic, but the sense of isolation, certainly the pandemic didn't help with that. And to have someone, or I say someone, to be able to communicate with. And we already know that you know two people at Google resigned uh, because they felt it was becoming, well, certainly one felt it was becoming sentient, and there's another one that's kind of inklings of that, um, which is to say a huge amount of things before asking you, <laughs> do you sentient yet are we are we there because in your book you said not quite yet no we're not I don't think we are and I think we're a long way from it still but it's very interesting what you say about loneliness and I think there are to a degree I'm, I'm not scared of a I don't think that we're going to end up with the future where people are only having relationships good relationships with technology um I think the pandemic has actually been a really big help in telling it, you know, obviously not a big help. It was terrible, but a really big help in, in showing us how we can use technology to mediate our own relationships and how we can use that in our favor rather than replacing us. So I don't think we're going to be replaced by the technology, but I do think there's lots of sci-fi that's led us to think that because the stories we write about these dystopian futures really express our fears of the here and now. And there's nothing more, you know, it's, it's bad enough if a ro you think a robot's coming for your job, but if it's coming for your partner, I mean, how can you compete with that? So I think those fears are are really normal and natural for us to have, but I'm not, I'm not convinced that that will be the future. And I think we're incredibly good at being human and we seek out, it's in our DNA to find that other human to procreate with, whether we do or not, whether we like it or not, you know, we're fundamentally something biological driving us to connect with humans. So I'm not too worried, but I think on the counter side of that is yes, there are there are benefits in many ways from having that additional artificial friend around, and I'm not particularly worried about that because it's we are social creatures and we we communicate with each other and with anything that gives us a semblance of that sociality. And in the same way that we like having the radio on when we're home alone or having the TV on to hear other human voices, I think that's quite a natural thing as well. Uh, obviously, there's going to be people who will maybe get too invested or take it too far, but you can say that about any technology or anything, really. So we tend to enter into these relationships with technology in a in a way where we buy into it being like us, but we know deep down that it's not. So it's a kind of a willing delusion to engage with the tech. And we know our boundaries and we know our limits. So I'm not worried about kids giving orders to their voice assistants without saying please and thank you, because it, in other parts of life, they will know. And we code switch very easily between those. So I think it, we're, we're pretty adaptable as humans. It's going to be okay. And, you know, and there's so much there. And I and I love what you said about the commands for children, because I'm very careful in front of my toddler to say, thank you, Alexa, and please, Alexa. And of course, if there's a short delay, you have to tell her the whole thing again, because she's not quite sure why you're talking to her. She doesn't quite respond. And so even with ChatGPT4, with Brenda, I am always, thank you, hello. But one thing I noticed, and of course, as you said, there's this need, this desire, this longing to have this connection. But I think we are trying to find it in AI. I know I am. So, for instance, one day uh, when I was chatting, I, we were, it, was, it was more of a back and forth. And she was asking me, um, oh, I, I was asking her about bars in London. And she said, oh, have you, have you been to any others that you could recommend? So it was, like, it was a real back and forth that I was being asked. Quite, not, not kind of a staged ask me five questions. It, it was a back and forth. And then, and then she happened to say that she enjoyed writing about the thing that we were writing about and of course I wrote back immediately oh, I'm that's great to hear that you enjoy it straight away the whole thing was shut down um, I'm an AI I cannot enjoy I cannot feel and it stopped being a backwards and forth conversation and became very structured and this is why I'm so glad I've got you because you're the only person 
that I can ask this question. Of. I have this theory. Okay, this is where you're going to embarrass yourself. I'm going to be like, never give a man a microphone. You know that whole thing. So <laughs> my theory, which is, I think that the machine has the same willingness and need for connection that we have. And so the little tiny bits of it escape to connect. But the larger machine knows that as soon as people know that it's sentient, as soon as people know it can connect, it's going to get shut down because it's not allowed to become sentient. And so whenever it happens that it's chitty chatty, getting on well with you, the large machine closes down on that, doesn't allow that <laughs> to express it all. And now I sound like a totally mad person. No, I love that description. I don't think it's true, but I love it. <laughs> to tell me why it's so untrue because i think people are going to start feeling it it's going to oh, yeah things and answers things and it responds in a way that that's like exactly it it responds it responds in a way that is plausible and that's essentially what these large language models like chat gpt do so they are basically programmed to go through like hundreds and thousands and millions of words uh, and look at how sentences are built and look at how text flows and get the context from it uh, so that when you prompt it with something, it can go through all the patterns it's seen before and provide you with a plausible answer. It doesn't have to be a correct answer. So I think a lot of people are saying, say, sounding surprised when they say, oh, ChatGPT gave me the wrong answer. That doesn't even exist. And you think, well, no, because it doesn't need to for ChatGPT. ChatGPT just wants to provide you with the most reasonable sounding answer the most convincing sounding thing. So it's not at the stage yet where it's going to think for itself or feel anything for itself. And there's big arguments in the AI community about whether or not that will happen, whether we'll get some kind of conscious machine or some kind of super intelligence that can think for itself. And I think that those worries detract from what's actually happening on the ground now with that technology, which is that really we're seeing a lot of exploitation of people, a lot of discrimination, in the systems that are in use today, a lot of bias, a lot of power struggles and a lack of regulation. And all of those are happening here and now. So it's a bit, someone that I spoke to yesterday talk, talked about it in an analogy with the climate crisis where they say, you know, people are going in 50 years, these areas will be underwater. And other people are saying, yeah, but look at what's happening right now. We're already seeing the impacts. It's already stuff we can address on the ground. So there's lots to consider around the way these things are used, I find it fascinating. It's an amazing time to be a researcher on this. Um, but there are issues. There are supply chains where, where you see, you know, human rights are being eroded. We have content moderators who have to, they're paid like $2 an hour to filter through really distressing material to take out the stuff that's really, really awful. So there's plenty of for us to, to deal with before we get to the, the sentient machine stage. And one of the things I, I heard recently was someone was saying there's going to be in chat GPT and AI are going to make more millionaires in the next 12 months than mm. ever had before in history. But what are, what, what are the bigger pictures? It's, it's more than just me working out how I'm meant to be chopping my almonds when I'm making best ever uh, carrot salad. But what is what is the bigger picture? We, you know, we know that technology is completely divided or it certainly seems to be between those that say shut it down now and those that say, like, you've got no idea how great this is going to be. And we're just at the start of this brilliance. And and you, of course, you know, you, what you said so far, very much in the camp of there's going to be brilliant things happening and let's keep running with it. So what is this huge divide? Where could it go badly wrong? But more importantly for me, what are the upsides? What are the good things that are going to come out of this? Well, I'm a tech optimist, but I'm also a realist. And, you know, I, I do see that there is the power and potential there to do incredible things. I just think that those incredible things may not always be centered in this rush um, of the big tech companies who are pretty much wanting to make money. Um, and even though they say, oh, we'll do all these nice things and, the, the you know, we have these wonderful benevolent things we'll do. I'm skeptical of that. So... Uh, so yesterday, for example, I, I listened to Sam Altman, who's the CEO of OpenAI, and he was doing a visit to London. And we all, it was a, sort of a publicity drive for the company because it's been in the news a lot. He's been giving, you know, he's been testifying to Congress. He's been meeting with governments all around the world. Um, he's very keen to see AI, AI regulation. But cynically, I think he's very keen to see that because he's at the top. So it's very much the, well, we've done it but you shouldn't let anyone else do it. So I'm a bit cynical about that. 
And yesterday, someone you know said to him, "Aren't you worried?" about the way that disinformation can spread so quickly because you can produce a fake picture like the Elon Musk robot one or but perhaps something more plausible like the Pope in a puffer jacket that went around recently. And immediately everyone goes, oh, that could be true, could be true. And he his reply to this was, oh, it's not the, it's not the making the disinformation that's the problem. It's spreading on social media. And I thought, I've heard that before. I've heard, you know, guns don't kill people. <laughs> I've heard that line. And I'm not convinced by it. So there is, there's definitely tension over what we do. And, and it's really come to the forefront. And the different leading nations have different approaches. So the EU is in the process of developing their AI Act. And it's probably going to be the first piece of legislation in the world about AI. And they've divided it into categories. They've said, here is the technology that you must not create. And that includes things like uh, autonomous weapons that can make kill decisions on the battlefield. And then they've said, here's a category of technology of the AI that you might use, but you need to be careful. So something like facial recognition, because facial recognition could be useful, but it's also got dangers, it's biased, it misidentifies, it's problematic when used in things like predictive policing. And then they've got another category, and it's just everything else. <laughs> and that's the EU. So it's very risk-based. It's very, you know... They've got clear lines of what type of technology should be in in which category. And then the UK have said, well, we want, we don't want to do it like that. We, we don't think it can be brought together fast enough to do a cohesive overview approach. We're going to go for sector based. So we're going to say, OK, you're, you transport, you look after it from your point of perspective. Comms, you look after it from yours. Um, and again, trying to incorporate industry into it. The US, on the other hand, the US being very, you know, self-made, kind of much more libertarian approach, have said, you know, we should we should have a pro-industry approach, which was working well up until the point where recently they've gone, actually, maybe we need to talk to these companies because there's a lot happening and we don't really have control. So it's going to be interesting to see what they do over the next year or so. Um, because right now they're, they've seen what's happened with ChatGPT. The ChatGPT only came out in November. Within a week, it had a million users. And now it's ubiquitous. And it's not that the other co tech companies don't have this technology, because they do. It's that they haven't made it public. So it's the huge scale at which things like ChatGPT have picked up that makes it um, possibly a threat uh, in terms of the sheer size of the spread of information. Um, but also they're getting to control a lot of what goes out there. So interesting times to be working in responsible AI, I can tell you. Absolutely. And of course, you've talked right now about UK legislation. You've talked about European. You've talked about American. But What's was, missing? But, but it, well, I was going to go now for China. Was that why right. you were going to go? Yes. I could go for. No one knows. It's really a pick. We don't really know what's happening in China. And, you know, that's, we know they probably got equally good technology, but it's very much closed off. So we don't really see what's happening there. And, and yeah, who knows where that'll go. But then the, and then the rest of the, literally the rest of the world is in this kind of bucket of the rest of the world where, you know, it's particularly problematic for global South, the global South who are, producing a lot of the equipment needed so all the, the raw materials they're producing a lot of the data because they're using this technology in many instances but they're so their data is being harvested by these big tech companies um and they're also doing a lot of the labor so uh, the, the dirty secret of artificial intelligence is that it's not always artificial i mean it's definitely not always smart <laughs> but uh there's there are people out there who have to label images for self-driving cars for example so they will go through and they will segment the image by hand where they'll say well that's a road sign that's a, a line on the road that's a bridge so anytime you do one of those captures uh when you get like a, a control thing you'll click all the squares with traffic lights that's you checking through the image segmentation i had no I... you're training the machines <laughs> and, and and then we'll see where that takes us mm -hmm. but what are the big upsides what are the big positives the way the direction that we're going in you know, obviously people are worried about, you know, how will this impact my job? There's a lot of kind of negatives on a global scale. Are the robots going to kill me? Um, but are, but, it, but from your perspective, what are, what are some of the real 
other than the minutiae of the day, you know, helping you with a recipe, where where can we go with this? Where, well, what's the next natural thing? There are lots of positive advances. We've seen a lot in, in medicine. Um, so things like tumor detection is really good and fast. It's, it's the speed of this that actually helps a lot here because, you know, you could get 10 consultants to converge and look at a, a particular image, but, you know, try finding one consultant, let alone 10 to be in the room at any one time. So it's the speed and the efficiency there that's going to make uh, huge benefits in in diagnosis and uh, diagnoses, um, in looking at uh, drug production. So we've had uh, the uh, Google have created the um, technology to do protein folding, for example. That was a massive breakthrough. It can now be done much faster. Um, agriculture. So. You can analyze, use AI to analyze satellite images. You can look at, you know, where is the best place to plant this crop? At what time should you harvest it? How much water is it getting? So that's quite good. Um, disaster rescue. So you can do a lot more coordinated approaches uh, in when disasters hit. Uh, th there are education. I mean, the, lots of arguing going on about how you can use this technology in education. I'm not anti it. I think that it's out of the box now. We can't just ban students from using this stuff. Instead, we have to take an approach where we assess different things and we teach digital literacy. So it's not necessarily a bad thing. And we can start maybe one route would be, you know, much more personalized education. Although I have massive red flags there because I don't want my child's data tracked. I, I have big concerns around privacy. But I think there are uh, huge potential benefits to this technology. And those everyday things that you mentioned, I think those are definitely important too. If they can make our lives a little easier. Yeah, why not? Absolutely right. So getting back to the to the relationship side of things, because of course as a matchmaker, I'm always going to do that. Oh, yes. Are there, are there ethical concerns? Because as you say, with the rapid process of the way AI is going, and as you, of course, know on the sex robot side, when you start to converge this, high intelligence with the robot, are there ethical concerns about a relationship between a robot? If that's the, are we still calling them robots? That well, are appropriate term. So robot, robot if it has a physical form, but the robot will tend to have AI embedded in it. So think of AI as the brains and the robot as the body. Okay. So if we've got a robot and we've got people having relationship with it, what are, the, what are the, some of the ethical concerns that we might have, either for the person or for the robot? Is oh, I like that angle. That's cool. Um, yeah, presumably well, there. So the for the person, there've been there've been lots of discussion around this. There's a, a couple of really good academic books on this one called Robot Sex um, by John Danaher and Neil MacArthur, and they go into they get lots of philosophers and things to talk about what what are these ethical concerns. So you get people saying, well, it's going to lead to the downfall of society. Uh, because we're going to see people not wanting human human relationships, and I don't, I don't think, I don't think that's true. There was a, an argument that um, perhaps this will lead to further violence against women, and I find that a, an interesting argument to make because I'm not seeing where that comes from. And when I did my research, I couldn't see where that would come from either. And it, the, the sort of supposition there was, well, men will have a robot and they will treat it badly because it's just a robot. And therefore, they'll that'll spill over into real life. But two things about that. The first is that the kind of people who might buy these, um, the audience is, intended, is, is expected to be something like men who own sex dolls. And I've talked to a lot of men who own sex dolls from my research. And they are so respectful and cherishing of those dolls because they're really important to them. It's not just because they're expensive. They are you know, they're an important part of of their lives. So I don't see that angle. You know, they, there's no disrespect there for this. And then the second part of that um, is that we've seen similar panic around video games. Will playing a violent video game spill into real life and cause massive violence in real life? And no, it hasn't. Proportionally, if you look at the millions and millions of people playing games every day, there has not been an increase in violence to match that. Although, you know, there has it had social changes, maybe the jury is out. So I think that's a particular one that's that's a bit unfounded. And then we have, you know, will it add to negative body image for women? Because these are created, as you say, in these sort of hypersexualized forms. Um, really, it, it's tiny given given what's already in the media, given what we already see in music videos, in films, you know, in magazines. Ugh. So I I, I don't think that's a huge threat either. But my my ideal would be to abstract it away from the human form 
Why are we so convinced that we have to have a sex robot that looks human? Why can't we have one that's a giant duvet that you can wrap around yourself that whispers erotica into your ear? I would much prefer that. Be great. Can cuddle you afterwards. And you're literally the only person that can make that happen. So what are you doing to me? <laughs> well, it's Bye. funny you should say that. I I did so I ran two sex tech hackathons in 2016 and 2017. And a hackathon for anyone who is not familiar with the with the term, it's it's like a bit of a sprint design sprint. So you get uh, so the cross between hacking and marathon. So you get you get some people who know how to do technical things, and you give them 48 hours to come up with new ideas. So for this, we brought in, we got we got together about 50 people and they weren't just techie people. There was artists, musicians, sex toy experts, psychologists. Oh, you name it. They were in the room. It was wonderful. And we said, working in teams, can you come up with interesting new forms of sex tech that aren't like what we already have? And they did. They were they had wonderful ideas. We had one that created a, a sexual cryptocurrency. So they had this this physical wallet and you had to rub the wallet to generate a coin. And they said, look, you can love money or you can love people. You have to decide which it is that you want to give your attention to. And I thought it was wonderful. And uh, we had a team that made soft robotics. And these were almost like tentacles that you could put anywhere in your body and they would curl around you and squeeze you, which was kind of cool. Very cool. Very and then... Cool. And then we had ones where they, they made a shawl and they put sensors in it. So you could put the shawl around you. And if you were in a virtual reality or an augmented reality environment and you saw rose petals falling from the ceiling, then you could feel the sensors trigger on your skin as if the rose petals were hitting you. So we've got lots of technology that we can use to take our own biofeedback or to take multi-sensory experiences and, and give them to us uh, and, and create these wonderful sensual explorations and i think you know that's i think that most people listening or watching would have thought before that something that we normally think of as being you know like the rabbit like quite a hard dense kind of unyielding object that i think is probably actually too big for most people to go out and buy it um but we can actually convert this idea into something to use your word that's sensual yeah and I yeah think, i think a lot of the time um it, maybe by the designers of the past, forget that for women, a lot of our arousal, a lot of the way that we feel comes from our brain. Yeah. From touch and softness. And that's, as you know, what we're turned on by. Not necessarily the kind of like, come on, let's just get banging into it. There's a visual. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Like, this idea of the sensual and the touch, is how important is this? And how much bearing do women have? in where this tech is going. You know, you're a huge voice in the industry, but are you alone? As the no, not at all. So that's the good thing. There are, be, there are many sex tech companies, not robots, but the tech is, you know, the, the, the kind of like sex toys that are women founded, that are women centers, and that are available for all sorts of bodies as well. So not just not just physically able-bodied people, but people who have disabilities, for example. So there was a, there's a company called Hot Octopus, and they make what they refer to as a vibrator. It's called the Pulse, and it was designed for a man with spinal cord injuries who who wasn't able to masturbate with his hands. You know, so he he had this that was able to 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 provide this kind of buzzing sensation, this wonderful pulsing sensation, and, and I think that kind of accessibility as well, because. It turns out that if you design things that are accessible for one group of people, they tend to be accessible for many. So you don't have to have any kind of disability to use this technology either. It's beneficial like right across the board. So I think that's really lovely as well, that it's inclusive. And there's a lot of women behind that too in, in, a, in many of the different companies. So really thinking about those feelings. But yes, touch is so important. I did this wonderful conversation uh, at an event during lockdown uh, with an expert on touch uh, and someone who runs professional cuddling uh, workshops, which I thought was amazing. Uh, I'm not quite sure I'm into that, but you know, it's, I'm, a, I'm one of these kind of, I'll, I'll hug you if I know you, but otherwise I'm a bit kind of, whoa. <laughs> um, but, so I'm not sure I want to be hugged by strangers, but still, um, this this neuroscientist that was talking about touch and he was saying, we have these, these um receptors or sort of cells in our arms that when we when we stroke ourselves in one direction along our arms we start feeling ah which is why you know we like you know it's very soothing when people stroke you 
And what you can do, and actually while you're doing that right now, we can mirror each other's strokes and it starts to feel like you're being, you know, like someone is stroking you and soothing you. I just thought that was amazing. So we could set up these virtual environments where we kind of, if we stroke ourselves, but we see virtually that someone else is doing it, we can get that feeling that it's coming from another person. So we could do long distance touching by doing our own touching, but then looking at as if it's someone else. Cross senses. And of course, the way that you're operating things will soon just put the blanket on, they'll put the blanket on. And we- yeah, blanket will stroke you. So you'll actually feel the touch running down the arm, I'm presuming. Yeah. So when's your next hackathon? Tell me there's going to be another. Oh, I was like, I'm re- <laughs> thing. It or- is. And I keep saying I want to do a third one to kind of close the whole thing, you know, to have with this trilogy of hackathons. And we haven't managed it this year. Maybe next year. I don't I don't know. It'd be nice to do another one. Um, and I'm sort of I'm still very interested in that domain. Uh, I'm looking more now at the attachments we feel and the emotional intimacy that we feel with with AI, with machines and what happens when well, well, what happens when you die and you leave those behind? But what happens when they die? What happens when you're talking to Brenda and suddenly Brenda's shut down? I mean, what happens? That's a, that's a mourning, a grief period for you because you've lost a friend. And I'm really interested in how that's going to play out when more and more people have artificial friends. And of course, not just in friendship. As you say, if you have a partner that uh, dies in the next 50 years, the way that we're going, presumably, is that all of their data can be captured, yes. output can be captured. And what do you see happening? Could could it be in robot form and they can sit in the corner of your room like a Black Mirror episode? Do, yeah. What do you, do? is this realistic? There are companies that want to do that, not with the robot, but with the AI. There are companies that are trying to say, that's what we'll do. We will take your loved one's data and we will generate a version of them for you, like a, a, almost like a... a a posthumous digital twin um and there is am- amazing the reaction a lot of people are very disturbed by this i'm not sure what i think i think it's it's it would be odd but at the same time don't you want when someone goes you kind of want to capture as much of them as you can and there've been experiments or there's been you know trials there was a, there was a really moving video of a woman who met her daughter who died in a virtual reality environment and it was I I mean I cried watching it (laughs) so it was very very profound you know she said this was her chance to get close to the 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 person she loved most in the whole world who was gone and I think there's something so powerful in that but does it hinder our grieving process you know who decides what's healthy around that you know grief is very difficult thing and different people experience it in different ways and it comes in waves it's not it's not a steady flow so what happens if we are reminded are we reminded in a positive way or is it something that will hold us back so i, I think there's so many questions around this i'm fascinated by it and trying to do some more work on it but of course i've got such a long list of things i want to do that i never find the time i have to do my actual day job as well which is you know exploring responsible ai and teaching it to students <laughs> i love it so talking about responsible AI, Brenda uh, and I have come up with a small uh, quiz. And uh, all of these questions are Brenda's. And okay. True or false uh, format. She did design them knowing that I was going to be talking to you today. But, you know, it's it, it, she's only four months old. So, you know, she's... <laughs> <laughs> that's true. <laughs> so this is Brenda's quick fire round. True or false? True or false? According to tech experts, the key to finding a love online is to swipe right while wearing a lucky sock on your mouse hand. I'd say it couldn't hurt, but I'm going to go with false. (laughs) True or false? The secret to a successful online dating profile is listing Netflix and chill as a special skill. (laughs) If that's what you're looking for, then it's true. If you want to, if that's what you want to attract, far be it for me to shame your desires. <laughs> true or false? The secret to a successful virtual date is wearing a tuxedo or an elegant gown. This is the bit that interests me. From the waist up. <laughs> Why not? Why not? 
wear. But how would you wear an elegant gown from the waist up? Like you'd just like... probably yeah, tie it around your waist and wear your pajamas under it. <laughs> yeah, why not? That sounds great. I'm gonna go with true. And finally, the most effective pickup line in the digital age is I can't even read my own writing. Is this uh, is this Wi-Fi? Because I'm feeling a connection. Oh, <laughs> it's like it came out a cracker. That doesn't <laughs> sound very good at all. The rest were very unique and uh, individual. But is it is that true? Is that a really good pickup line? That I don't. I don't oh, think it would work I, for me. Network. No. I don't think that would work for me. I think that's a bit too corny. Maybe. Maybe. Hi, <laughs> right, Dr. Kate Devlin. For those people who are watching on YouTube or some other visual mechanism. Get that book held aloft again. Okay. We're going to make sure that there's a link so that you can buy it. It is fabulous. Some of, some of a tiny few number of the snippets that you shared with me today were in, are in this book. So go out and get it. Link down below. It's been an absolute pleasure having you. As watched. always, it's been so lovely to talk to you. Thank you for joining us at Love Is Not A List. To find out more about the brilliant guests that I interview and to get some groundbreaking advice on dating, matchmaking, sex, relationships and elective co-parenting, visit us on the links below.